Look into my eyes. Your eyelids are feeling heavy. On the count of three, you will be asleep. One, two, three. Okay, forget all about that. This is me. I'm Christopher Green, and I'm a hypnotist. In fact, my life pretty much revolves around hypnosis. Yeah, I've slightly overreacted, and I'm a trained clinical hypnotherapist. I've done lots of research into, into hypnosis, because I've always taken a, a rather over-academic approach to trashy performance. That's always been my way. My name's Ida Barr, good afternoon. And I uh, used to be a music hall singer, known for such numbers as I had a little thrush, but now it's gone away. I can't be held responsible for what goes on in your mind. I'm also a stage hypnotist and a character comedian. I've always been interested in how to get an audience to do what, what I'd like them to do. And I think all performances have hypnosis to some degree. People are always amazed that I get the whole audience up to do the okie koki at the end. I'm also currently the artist in residence at the British Library, conducting research into, yes, you've guessed it, hypnosis. Everything that human beings do is habit, and all habit can change. Hypnosis is just a technique that you, you, people can use in order to change those habits. And so all you're doing as a hypnotist is encouraging people to change the habits. That's what excited me about it. I was just blown away by it. I thought this was absolutely incredible. It just seems so powerful and, uh, and yet so simple and so straightforward. Yet at the same time, there's this whole sort of flashy showbiz element to it. And there's this whole kind of, aha. I am the man who has this strange occult power. And as a performer, I always like that. In fact, I'm interested in the intersection between the two, showbiz and science. And I'm interested in where they overlap. In the Venn diagram, I'm interested in this little bit in the middle. It's this dichotomy between science and the stage that really fascinates me. Is the science just showbiz? Or is the showbiz, in fact, science? And when all is said and done, is hypnosis actually real? To try and answer this question, I've decided to really push myself personally and professionally. I've read a lot about using hypnosis instead of traditional anaesthetic. I've decided to challenge myself and see if I'm up to the task of hypnotizing someone not to feel pain during an operation. The thought of this genuinely terrifies, but really intrigues me. The only thing that terrifies me more than the thought of having an operation without anaesthetic is me being the hypnotist, hypnotizing someone to have an operation without anaesthetic. But I really want to push myself. Before I commit to this process, however, I want to investigate what hypnosis really is. From its mesmerizing beginnings and its mysterious history to its complex and controversial present. From forgotten 19th century stage shows to radical bloodless surgery. Along the way, I'll try and answer some persistent questions about the craft. Can anyone be hypnotized? Can you be made to do something against your will? Was Hitler a hypnotist? And can I make you cluck like a chicken? Ultimately, I'll ask myself whether I can use this mysterious and little understood skill, not just to entertain, but really radically help change lives. I like the fact that you're doing that whilst using these rather archaic techniques of saying, your eyelids are growing heavy. Yes, heavy. You know, and it, there's a slight performance, and as a performer, I like that kind of cheeky performance, and yet I do want to help them change. It's easier to give in than to resist. So listen to the sound of my voice and resist the resist. You're in the midst of something new, something you can't control. And that thrills you, or it chills you. I will hear my voice still proves 
its authority. Listen to me, not your insecurity. It's easier to give in than to resist. So listen to the sound of my voice. Thank you very much. Um, that was very rock and roll, wasn't it? Um, reverb. Woo, bring it on. Okay, hi, welcome. Um, you are going to hear some songs from me tonight and some songs uh, from The Singing Hypnotist. That was The Singing Hypnotist there. Uh, at this stage in this work in progress, they're a little bit similar. So I'll talk you through which is me and which is the character. Okay. <laughs> I know. Bear with me. It's work in progress. So it's all about using songs uh, to hypnotise. Um, so welcome. I, I, we've, we've started with a bit of mystery and a little bit of kind of, woo, bloodless surgery, and oh, look deep into my eyes. And uh, so some of you might be feeling a little bit nervous and tense at this point about what's going to happen over the next hour or so. All right? <laughs> I just thought maybe what we should do is just turn around, shake hands with the people around you, and just share your fears and concerns with everyone. <laughs> So just, uh, just introduce yourself and say, I'm a little bit nervous. What do you think he's going to do? Uh, why is he wearing that suit? Um, what's happened to his hair? Just, you know, just gang up on me so then we're even. All right? So just do it now. Say hello to people. Just thank Very good, yes. I'm hearing a lot of fear. Yeah. Okay, very good. <laughs> you relish that opportunity. Um, good. I will, we'll come back to that in just a couple of minutes. Um, thank you for introducing yourselves to each other. Welcome. Uh, so the, the singing hypnotist, he is not a historical figure. Uh, I wish he was. I wish he was real. I long to find him. He's, uh, in fact, made up. Uh, I thought that I would find him in the archives here at the British Library, and uh, I kept searching and researching, and I was like, where is he? And then I just did the obvious thing as a creative artist. I just invented him. Um, which is apparently not what researchers do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's the difference. So he is a composite of the many mesmerists and hypnotists that I've been reading about here in the library, um, the real and the fictional, from people like Mesmer. There's Mesmer, the, the person who you know, invented the whole, the whole craft. And um, uh, to the col huge cultural resonance of Du Maurier's Svengali. There you go. Ooh, scary. Um, but none of these people sang. <laughs> Is he still scaring you? Okay, workshop your fears. Um, what's been interesting about researching hypnosis and going all the way back to its early days as, as mesmerism is that uh, it's not really changed in, in, in a very long time. Um, and a lot of my work, especially um, as Tina C, which is a character some of you might know, is about being political and about being up to, the, up to date. So it's somewhat strange and, I have to say, very luxurious for me uh, to realise that, you know, you can get away with doing what people have been doing for 160 years. Uh, the techniques and routines aren't used traditionally to reflect what's going on in the world, wars or leaders or gossip or scandal. They're a current that seems to run a little bit deeper than that. So this research, as, as mentioned in the film, um, is at the intersection of science and showbiz. In showbiz, you save your conclusions to the end. Uh, it's called a finale. Uh, apparently, in science, uh, you give your findings at the start, at the start of the paper, right? Any scientists can find that? Yes, exactly, in the abstract. Um, because, you know, I've been the artist in residence at the British Library, I'm feeling all very academic, uh, I'm going to give my findings at the beginning, in a slightly scientific look how pleased I am with myself. <laughs> so um, I'm going to give you my conclusions right here at the start. 
So I've studied the entertainment and therapeutic history of hypnosis, and I think that human beings are remarkably ingenious. Because there's so many ways in which we use hypnosis, using the stage. Here we go, this is my, uh, this is my stage hypnosis character. It's called Derek Diamond. And yes, that is a wig. <laughs> Save yourself the bother of asking each other, do you think that's a wig? Yes, it is. Um, using the consulting room. This is uh, from 1909, uh, inducing hypnosis, and uh, using crazy machines. So one of the little side alleys while I was here at the, at the British Library was going to the patent office. And if anyone has not been there, um, I urge you to go. It's really good fun, because human beings have just invented the most crazy nonsense. And uh, you can spend a very happy morning in there, just looking at things that people have, uh, have, uh, have patented. And um, I'm not going to show you all of the things, um, because it, it would just take us down a, a very entertaining side alley, but including the machine for carrying a small dog, where you put a muzzle at one end and a thing up its bum and carry it. <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to tell you, but it's on my blog. So there you go, there's an incentive to, to look at my blog. Forget about the academic research. There's a thing where you put something up a dog's bum. <laughs> Um, but there were lots of machines, which is what took me in there, uh, lots of machines to induce hypnosis. And uh, this is um, an early one, very complicated, lots of cogs and wheels. Woo. And then there's uh, a much more uh, up-to-date one, I think from the 70s. We can have a look at that. There we go. So this entire room is sort of set up to induce hypnosis, which, you know, I'm not giving away any secrets. I could do like that. But, you know, there we go, from 1974. And then there's one from... Um, yeah, a couple of years ago, uh, 2010, where you sort of sit in a pod and hypnosis is in, uh, induced. And then this is my personal favourite, um, which is incredibly simple. It's just two bits. Isn't that great? I can't remember what year that is, but it's really old. Um, and you, there we are, 1909. You kind of wear this disc on your head, and then this bit here is attached, and it comes out, and it sort of goes like that. <laughs> and you follow it and then you get hypnotised. Clever, isn't it? Someone thought of that. <laughs> and then there's, uh, if you just show us the, the next one. This is also really old, 1899, and it very, very slowly rotates in this way, and then this very cleverly lights up and goes, sleep, sleep. <laughs> so these are just some ways in which human beings have... Um, used hypnosis and all they're doing really is they're suggesting, one person is suggesting to another person that they might be free, free of their normal thought patterns, that they can change their thought patterns. They're just saying, how would it be if you felt okay? So it seems that we need quite sophisticated strategies to shock us into the simplicity of being healed. So for myself, I've distilled all of this phenomenal human activity down to one sentence construction, which is, how would it be if? How would it be if you were as powerful as you know yourself to be? How would it be if you were content or philanthropic or a leader or a healer or, I don't know, a show-off trashy pop star or, you know, just talking to myself and what I want. But do you know what I mean? How would it be if you were free? How would it be if you weren't afraid of dogs or spiders or buttons? Because that's a real phobia, apparently. Or, or, or death or living. You know, how would that be? I find all this extraordinarily moving. Sort of 200 years of the history of hypnosis, and is that what it is at heart? For me, it is. And, of course, lots of trashy showbiz as well. And that's what's brilliant about hypnosis. Science, trashy showbiz. Um, what we could do in a slightly scientific way of kind of reversing the whole procedure, should we, does, anybody got any questions they want to do now instead of waiting to the end? Anybody worried about what's going to happen and they want to just vocalise it now? Will there be bloodless surgery? <laughs> no. Uh, seriously, I will answer any questions right now. And I will say one thing, which is that there won't be... Uh, I'm not going to be actually hypnotising anyone tonight. That's partly to do with the, the licence here at the British Library. <laughs> Bizarre, I know, but they are not set up um, for uh, stage hypnotist demonstrations. I know, that's a bit of an oversight, isn't it? Camden Council were not to be persuaded that it was a scientific demonstration, which is kind of what I suggested in the form. But anyway. 
Uh, all right, we will come back to questions if you want, unless anybody's got a burning desire to ask anything now. Uh, no, sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. Oh, yes, Dan, please. Okay, do some hypnotists really hypnotize people? It's, it's a very... Right, <laughs> so I'm, I'm just relaying because you're not Mike. Uh, I've been for hypnosis and it was pathetic. Um, no, that, no, it's good. So in order to answer your question, I think we have to ask another question, which is what is hypnosis? Big question. And what is a hypnotic trance? What were your expectations? Um, maybe your expectations were high, hence the pathetic, you know, <laughs> ratio. And the person hypnotizing you in a, sp in a was it in a hypnotherapy I thought context? I'd be aware yeah. Of what was going on. I thought I'd be in some sort of, you know. I think the it's really interesting because I think as human beings we have a desire to not be aware of uh, to not be conscious. Don't you? Don't you think? So like using drugs or, or drink or meditation or hypnosis, we have a desire to be taken over and for our consciousness not to, not to go on in that sort of slightly tedious way that it does all the time, where you're having a really lovely time and then you think, oh, have I left the gas on? Or, you know, oh, how am I going to get home? Or, oh, it's cold. Or, do, do you know what I mean? We have a desire for our consciousness to be taken over. And if, you, if it was in a hypnotherapy context, then they really should have talked you through um, what your expectations were and that you wouldn't lose your everyday consciousness. And um, now then, the, then how does that relate to stage hypnosis? What is the person on stage uh, experiencing? Well, what we see often is someone slumped over, looking like they're a completely empty vessel. But probably what's going on inside their heads is something completely different, which is, I'm so far into this, I better carry on. I'm just putting that thought in your head. <laughs> so what stage hypnotism does is plays with a lot of our expectations of what hypnosis looks like. And that creates a lot of problems for hypnotherapists. I know there's a few hypnotherapists here, so they would probably con concur with that. Because people come in thinking that they're going to be sort of sprawled out on a chair, um, you know, ready to be told to do the, to do the most ridiculous things. Uh, but that's not what hypnosis feels like. It might be just a sort of state where you're a little bit more relaxed and you are willing to go with suggestions a little bit more than you normally are. And, um, and, and so that's why hypnotists will always say, I can't make you do something against your will. You know, no one can, can, can say, I hypnotize you now, go and murder, you know, blah, blah. The person who asked that irritating question in the, in the <laughs> thing, sorry. No, not but, do, but do you know what I mean? You, we, we can't do that. You can't hypnotize people to do things against their will. It's only in Hollywood B-movies B that it's been used like that. So one of the reasons I'm really interested in hypnosis is precisely for that reason, that we have such expectation of what it is, and yet the reality is something very, very different. And yet the reality is something very, very powerful, as people here will, I'm sure, have had uh, hypnotherapy for a variety of of, uh, of, of things, you know, for, for stop smoking or for phobias or whatever. It's a very powerful instrument for change. And yet stage hypnosis isn't used for that way. It's used precisely just, just to entertain and say, pretend to be Madonna live on stage. Three, two, one, Madonna live on stage. Go. Like a virgin. And, and then you're off. Um, and what I'm trying to do in the, in the show, in the development of the show, is maybe use stage hypnosis as something that can heal, that can set people free. Um, and just make them feel a little bit more positive about themselves. Um, uh, so that's where we're trying to go uh, with this whole thing. Okay, thank you very much for asking questions. I'm not going to hypnotise someone to murder you. I don't know where that thought came from. <laughs> <laughs> what we're going to do is imagine how would it be if we were at the British Music Hall because I dug out a whole load of music hall songs that are in the British Library uh, archive, and uh, this is an original one um, uh, about hypnotism. Uh, there's another one which has not got such a good tune, which the, the, the shtick of that is basically, uh, how do I hypnotize people? Uh, well, I just hit them over the head with a very big stick. <laughs> um, quite a funny conceit, but unfortunately that's the only joke. So we're not doing that one, we're doing this one instead. Thank you. Take your time. <laughs> Now, 
Egotism is the force by which the world is ruled. It heals the sick and by its use, the wisest men are fooled. I've studied hypnotism and I use it every day. When I do things that others can't, I always hear them say. It must have been Svengali in disguise with his bright hypnotic eyes. We were taken by surprise. I do my work so well that everyone I mesmerize says it must have been Svengali in disguise. Your turn next time, all right? Yeah, <clears throat> You've heard how Adam lost his home, although the fault was Eve's. They had no time to pack their trunks, they simply took their leaves. <laughs> Come on. It's quite good, isn't it? Don't blame me, it was written a long time ago. <laughs> the serpent hypnotized poor Eve, and when she ate the fruit, the snake took his false whiskers off and said, you'll have to scoot. It must have been Svengali in disguise with his bright hypnotic eyes. We were taken by surprise. I do my work so well that everyone I mesmerize says it must have been Svengali in disguise. Lovely. Let yourselves go. Smash him. <clears throat> a doctor fell into a well and broke his collarbone. He should have tended to the sick and left the well alone. <laughs> yeah, it's good. That joke repeats again in a minute because the songwriter was very pleased. So he reuses it. He held on to the bucket rope. I cut it and he fell. And though he once was with the sick, he now is with the well. It must have been. Svengali in disguise with his bright hypnotic eyes We were taken by surprise I do my work so well that everyone I mesmerize Then it must have been Svengali Again, double the volume It must have been Svengali in disguise with his bright hypnotic eyes We were taken by surprise I do my work so well that everyone I mesmerize Says it must have been Svengali in disguise. <clears throat> oh dear. Okay. The singing hypnotist. There have been many mesmerists and hundreds of hypnotists. Some use a fob watch. Some make mesmeric passes with their hands. One uses a donkey. Another, an owl. All to induce the trance that heals. But I am a showman, and I use my voice. My songs can hypnotize you. But the songs themselves are as powerless as a newborn baby, as powerless as that donkey. It is I, the singing hypnotist, that can heal or harm, seduce or reproof. Have a care, for this is powerful magic. I hope you're feeling strong, for here is the song. This song could hypnotize you If I wanted it to And I'm not sure that I do This song could entrap you Make you do things you didn't know you wanted to do But will you? Not if I don't want you to This song could make you fall in love But what's falling in love 
but a temporary trust. And I can cause those with no recourse to romance. This song could choose to seduce you, but then I'd lose you too soon. I want you to stay, I want you to play. You're the half-dead rat on the kitchen mat, and yes, this song's the cat. It's brought me you to make me happy, and you do. The song could make you spill the truth If I wanted this song to undo the layers of you that make you you But I'm still not sure that I do This song is smoke and mirrors To give us slippers the deeper rivers of the thoughts within us an over-rhymed sleight of hand that only a subconscious understands. The song is over there, and look, it's over here. And it was heard back then, and one day it will soon appear. But this song is clear. But this song is just a song. I used to be afraid of birds. It was a phobia. Is that you? You testifying? <laughs> yeah, sister. It was a phobia. Um, I find it better to say that I was afraid. It's less medical and more truthful. It certainly got in the way of my life. My husband learned never to suggest eating outside because of evil seagulls. I was once standing outside Sid Sydney Opera House with two important producers and uh, a bird swooped down a bit close and I just fell on the floor, uh, which was a bit embarrassing, but totally essential. <laughs> I used to ask my therapist to help me with this fear. She would say, I wonder what the bird represents. Is it your parents? Is it maybe me? Is it maybe your nihilism? She didn't really help. <laughs> uh, I don't know where I got the idea to download a hypnosis MP3, but on New Year's Day morning, 2007, I listened to it. I embraced a here and now therapy. I was about to learn how painful leaving pain behind can be. Before the hypnosis started, it said, there are thousands of people who used to be afraid of birds walking down every street. And I thought, oh my God, I'll just become one of them. <laughs> and that thought had never occurred to me. I had never role modeled being all right before. I think before that, my role models were screwed up pain junkies. Uh, so yeah, it was a revelation. Oh, just be like someone who's all right. That's good. The hypnotism strengthened my resolve. It dissolved the fear that I would feel so much panic that the world wouldn't be big enough for my pain. I went on a one-day course to learn the basics of hypnosis, and me being me, I overreacted, and three years later, I qualified as a cognitive behavioral hypnotherapist. <laughs> yeah, it's a simple story, but in that time, everything about my life had changed. The first section of the hypnotherapy course was just after my husband was diagnosed with cancer, the second just before he was given a terminal diagnosis, and the third part was a year after I was widowed. And during that time, I came off antidepressants, I stopped drinking, I stopped taking drugs, I stopped being depressed, I started running, and I started 
if not always being loving to myself, at least being sort of vag vaguely civil. <laughs> and I uncovered the vast capacity that had always been in me to be happy. Hypnosis led to mindfulness and then to a daily meditation practice. Death and grief are powerful motivators for destruction or for liberation. Hypnosis was simply my technique to make sure that the devastation would help to set me free. And I used that technique, and I still use it. And I wanted to give you one little taste. Obviously, we won't be doing a full hypnosis session. Um, but this is a classic hypnotic uh, uh, little, little trick, really. Um, just so you get an idea of what it might be like. I know you'll be thinking, and just thinking about the washing up, obviously, because <laughs> your brain will be going. So like, just clasp your hands together. And hold them tight. And now focus on those hands. And I want you to play with the idea that they are locked together, that you can't pull them apart. Play with the ambivalent notions they are both in your head at the same time. Obviously, you know you can pull them apart. But play with the idea that you can't, that they are locked together, that they are solid. And then start to try and pull them apart and just see what that tension feels like. Just play with the idea that they are one fused unit. And now really try and pull them apart and see what happens. Some of you will be able to do it. Some of you absolutely won't. So just play with what does that feel like. OK, I'm suggesting, yeah, there you go. Quite a lot of you can't do it. Interesting. OK, and now I suggest to you that your hands are light and free, and you can all pull them apart. And give us a wave. There you go. Hooray! So it's all about playfulness and, and suggesting and not taking anything too literally. Um, all right. I met a couple of people in the archives of the British Library. I love it. The technicians, ah, oh, did you hurt your hands? They're all up there in the, in the box. Did you hurt yourself? I met a couple of people in the archives of the British Library, and I want to uh, spend 10 minutes just introducing you to my two favorite people from the, from the archives. And the first one is called Henry Blythe. And uh, here is his uh, you know, seminal album from the 50s, Stop Smoking. Uh, he's a really great guy. And he's, he, he's, very, he's the politest hypnotist I've ever heard. He said, I, I very much like you to, uh, to, to stop smoking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's really sweet. Um, and you, I researched him uh, in the National Sound Archive, and it took a really long time to, to get the LP and to make an appointment. And then I sat in a little booth with big headphones on, and um, you know, it, was, it was all quite a palaver. And then I went home, and I just looked him up on YouTube, and he's there. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and uh, this one is, is listed on YouTube as the worst hypnotist ever. Which I think is a little bit un unkind, because I like him. Um, uh, then his book uh, is called uh, The Truth About Hypnotism. Uh, now, actually, if you just go back to the previous picture, you'll see that Henry, not much variation in photo face. Every photo I've seen of him, go forward again. There you go, always the same, always the same. Uh, every photo I've always, always got the same, wise and kindly. Um, but he's very, thank you very much. Uh, he's really interesting because he was a, a, a stage hypnotist. He was on TV a lot in the 50s and the 60s. He's very, very showbiz, very mainstream. And he uh, started during his career to realize that people were coming to him and saying, you have changed my life. I've, I've been healed um, watching your performance or being part of your performance. And so he actually gave up his showbiz career and set up a therapeutic practice, which is a, a really interesting journey. And um, his, his book is absolutely delightful um, and has things like um, chapter 5, 1969, the year of the warts. Um, <laughs> it, it's all really, he's a bit bonkers. But he's, he's also really moving because he didn't set out to, to heal people. He set out to, uh, uh, to, to entertain, you know. And I thought that was an interesting journey. And he talks a little bit um, about the notion of healing and I just want to flag that up because I think I mean the same thing by healing, which is not healing from, you know, from cancer or heart disease or, or anything absolutely you know, direct. Um, 
so I, I mean kind of uh, a sort of generosity towards yourself and a kindness towards yourself and a, and a kind of self-liberation, if that's not too hippie and woolly for you. Um, but, uh, yeah, so he talks about that. He also talks, very interestingly, about what happens when he can't help someone. This is brilliant because it's self-serving and it's incredibly true as well. And he says, sometimes you can't help someone because they refuse to heal. So obviously that's a good get out for him. Um, but obviously at, at uh, some level, it's absolutely true. Uh, so I've written this song. This is not a singing hypnotist song, it's, it's mine. And it's kind of my response to that notion of refusing to heal. Um, because I like to think that I, I do, do not refuse to heal. I am open to the idea, but I think at some level we all refuse to heal. So uh, I'm going to come over here. Duncan is going to play the piano. <clears throat> This is a song imaginatively called They Refuse to Heal. On my mutability, emotionally, on my curative ability, taken the loss and gained, made something strong from what remains. I've healed, I know the deep, but my skin isn't taken in, either it wasn't told, or I'm just getting old. Maybe a lack of free radicals, but I'm not repairing well at all. Each cut takes forever to patch up. I'm being betrayed by my flesh. So yes, I too refuse to heal. I refuse to heal. These scabs aren't ideal. But they're here and they're real. They are me. And I can't feel the old pain anymore. So I take the scars for what they are and try to heal. Let's all try to heal. Let's all try. How would it be if you joined in? Is that right? Would you like to? Yeah. Let's all try to heal. Oh, beautiful. One more time. Let's all. How about we will try to heal? We will try. One more time. Thank you. So uh, I said there were a couple of people I wanted to introduce to you. And the other is a mesmerist, a lady mesmerist from the 1840s called Annie de Montfort. And uh, here's one of her posters. Um, it was very rare, um, just like now, there, there are hardly any uh, women in, uh, in you know, stage performance of, of mesmerism and hypnosis. Um, 
What I love about Annie de Montfort, many, many things, but, but basically it, she was not backwards in coming forwards. And her bill matter has, on her posters is absolutely brilliant. The wonder of the age. Uh, her mind governs the world. Her mind rules the world. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. And here she is hypnotizing someone to walk over Niagara Falls. Um, yes, it's, it, you know, she's, she's a really interesting character. The, she pops up in um, three posters from the Evanian collection here at the British Library, which is a collection of theatrical ephemera. Um, and, and then she's not really anywhere else in the public record. There's a couple of mentions of her in the trade press, um, which I kind of uncovered. Uh, it was a really interesting little, little journey. Um, so let's have a look at the next thing. Here we are. This is from the Era newspaper, an announcement. You'll see what I mean. The most powerful mesmerist in the world. Uh, concludes tonight at Queen's Hall, Liverpool. Uh, so, yeah, she's, she was an interesting character because she was the most powerful mesmerist in the world, she said. And she was uh, the daughter of a mill worker from, uh, from Leicestershire and uh, just was self-made, and I, I love that. It's classic show business. Okay, the next uh, one. Here we go. Her mind governs the world in Ilfacombe. <laughs> and the next one. This is a story which we found uh, in the Dundee Courier and Argos, not something I've read many, many times. Um, and it was the fact that she was uh, exposed as a, an imposter in America. So she was on tour in America, and they uh, basically exposed her, which is, is very interesting when you read the whole article, because what she's doing is not really anything. She's, she's not taking money by... Uh, by deception, particularly. It's just they were disappointed. They were a little bit like you. They had high expectations, <laughs> and they were lowered. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, the next one. OK, so I was intrigued not so much about her as a mesmerist, um, particularly, but more about how she just is there in the public record so fleetingly. Three posters, a few mentions in the trade press, and then this. Um, Miss Annie de Montfort, the mesmerist, was advertised to occupy this hall, but was unable to appear. And then nothing. And I found her death certificate, and she died 10 days after that announcement, uh, aged 46. And so I was intrigued by her, and um, I just liked the difference between her mind governing the world and then unable to appear. So uh, I think we've got one more poster. No one should fail to see Miss Annie. So I wrote a little song in praise of Annie de Montford, and uh, here it is. Saturday, 23rd of September. 1882 Psychological star fell From the public record Saturday 23rd Of September 1882 last we heard from you the most powerful mesmerist in the world her mind rules the world the most powerful mesmerist in the world her mind rules the world history's cruelty Dates on a page, exuberant claims for a decade, and then the grasping of other lives drowns her silence. Saturday, twenty third of September. 1882, unable to appear. The 
the most powerful mesmerist in the world. Her mind rules the world. The most powerful mesmerist in the world. Her mind rules the world. Friday, 25th January 2013. What will remain of you and me? <clears throat> Thank you. If you said to me a year ago when I started as Artist in Residence, what uh, do you think your favourite book would be that you, that you discovered? Um, I think I probably would have said something very old and redolent of history and, you know, sort of tear-stained, I, I don't know, something very evocative. But in fact, it's this, um, uh, A Practical Guide to Past Life Regression, uh, which you can buy on Amazon for about £1.20. Um, it's absolutely fascinating. Now, when I did my um, uh, hypnotherapy training, we covered past life regression in about six seconds, uh, which was past life regression, don't go there. <laughs> so I, being good boy, didn't, um, but then I did. Uh, so the, this book kind of really inspired me, and I went along and had a past life regression session. And I, very good value for money, I visited six previous lives. Um, <laughs> Which you can't argue with, can you? It's absolutely smashing. And I'm intrigued by, by, by it, partly because it is inherently funny, and we're just used to sort of making jokes about it. But the... the uh, and don't get me wrong, I will be in a minute. So, you know, I'm not that po-faced. But what the um, practitioner did, which was really, really intriguing, she, um, before she hypnotized me, she just did this little, um, th this little technique by which she got me to kind of use my instinct instead of my brain. Okay, bear with me. So she asked lots of questions to which I kept saying, I don't know. And she would say, and if you did know? I'd say, I don't know. And eventually you get worn down and you go, if I did know, um, yes. <laughs> now, after a while, I know, I know, yeah, don't be sceptical. Um, after a while, you start to kind of pluck the answers from, from the air and, and you start to use your instinct instead of your brain. And it, it was really powerful and I found it really, really, really interesting. And I'm not going to get into the whole thing, you know, was I visiting um, previous lives that I absolutely um, have lived through? Was it some sophisticated parlor game? Um, was it just nonsense? Was I just having a laugh and trying to get my money's worth? I, you know, but what it, it um, brought home to me was the power of our instincts that we normally cut ourselves off from. And so I just put that thought out there as a, as a serious thought. How would it be if we were ignoring our instinct most of the time? How would it be if you did know? Um, so I give you that thought. And then I'm going to be rude about past life regression. Because I had a, uh, an idea for a TV show. And I absolutely think this needs to be made and will be made. Watch this space. <clears throat> Oh, yeah, yeah, great to be here and everything. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, bro. I'm not normally up at this time in the morning, but for you, Shanae, yeah, it's great to be here. Yeah, hello, everyone at home. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, the program. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, well, it was a real journey. Uh, I went on a journey. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a journey. That's all I can say. Um, it's the only way I could describe it. I didn't expect to learn so much about myself, but I did, you know. When they asked me to be a guest on the show, I was like a bit, whoa, yeah, whoa, Ooh, you know, what, and everything. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm really glad I did it, yeah. Um, I mean, the public, they just know me as being cool and suave and a bit of a bastard in scalpel. But then when you're, you know, when you're playing a bloke doing an average of five autopsies uh, an episode and then solving the murders, 
Uh, you're not going to be all sweetness and roses, are you? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, you're right, Shanae. Yeah, everything changed when I started playing Charlie in Knifed. Do you? You like it? Yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? Thanks, thanks. It's a completely different kettle of fish. Yeah, because when you're playing a mortician's assistant who sneaks into the morgue and does the autopsies on the choir and then solves the murders, <laughs> obviously that's a very different character and a very different uh, set of skills and everything. Yeah, 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 you're right. My point is the public aren't going to believe me when they see me on this new show. Yeah, because I'm really glad they asked me to be the first guest on this show, which uses past life regression, yeah, to take celebrities back to their former lives. Yeah, I know, it's a brilliant idea, isn't it? Yeah, so it's called, Who Do You Think You Were? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's brilliant, it starts next Wednesday. Yeah, you've got to watch it. No, I was. I was very sceptical, Shanane. Yeah, because I hardly believe in this life, never mind my former ones. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm a real doubt in tomboy. That's me. Yeah. But they put me down in front of this hypnotist, right? And she explained, me to, explained to me what was going to happen, yeah? And I was a bit like, whoa, yeah, really? Yeah, whoa, no. Yeah. And then the next thing I knew, I was running through a meadow in a pinafore dress. Yeah, I know. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Obviously, it's a bit different doing it for the camera because you know that they're filming everything and that a big part of the deal is that they will recreate my former lives using other celebrities. So while I was 125% reliving being a Victorian school urchin being chased by geese, I was wondering if Sheridan Smith was too old to play the part. But she wasn't, and it all turned out well in the reconstruction and everything. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, didn't expect to cry so much. <laughs> Obviously, I expected to cry because it was in the contract. <laughs> but not so much. I realised, you know, when I realised I was, I'd been a geisha and had been attacked to death, in the shotgun area in ancient Japan, I was in front. It's so sad, you know. I can feel myself getting, you know, chucked up now, but it was really authentic, and they had the sumo wrestlers and everything. Yeah, yeah. What, oh, oh, the weather, right, yeah. Okay, so it starts on, on Wednesday. You've got to tune in. Who do you think you were? That's brilliant, yeah, it's really good. Thanks for having me on the show, everyone. Yeah, brilliant, good, right, bye, bye, thanks. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> Singing hypnotist. In the years since I've been performing as a singing hypnotist, I've gained much attention. I started moving beyond my stage act, started helping people to heal. But for me, it was all about the technique. I was a man mesmerized by mesmerism. It started to give me the confidence to think that people should listen to me. Listen to the sound of my voice I say this a thousand times On a working night Look deep into my eyes And I will mesmerize Is this the same man who went aboard? Never had any attention Never got a mention Never was looked at with love Never was looked at at all I command they understand That I can heal I can reveal the wholeness That lies beneath They see authority Maybe it's empathy 
when you've been lost, you understand the lost, understand lost. So maybe it's right that I say, listen to the sound of my voice. Look at me, you are me, but I'm no longer him, which means you too can win. But this has changed. They want more from me. It's like hearing the sap oozing through the trees. Is there really so much pain? My congregation, my, my followers, they are become a congregation. And I am not a leader of men. I am a man. I am not a prophet. I am not a god. I'm a trifler on a stage. On lonely nights like this, it feels like blasphemy. I love God, so this is my reverse apostasy. Lord, guide my hand. Lord, guide my voice. Guide those I go. Thy love is wide in I swim. Lord, lead me on. Lord, lead me strong. Lead those I lead. Thy love is broad in unfold. Heart and are 
here. They're more powerful than me. They overwhelm me. I'm simply the mechanism by which they set themselves free. It's not me. They're stronger than me.
Okay, okay. Oh. Okay, get up. Mega. That's right. Listen. Everybody put your fists in the air now. Air now. Everybody We're gonna take this in the top air right air now. now. Everybody put your fists in the air now If you're pain in your life, let me hear you say How would it be, how would it be to be exactly as you be Feel me, can't no one got power on me Can't nobody else set me free If you agree, put your fists in the air One, two, three, four And more, if you want more Let me hear you say it till your voice be sore I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna stop Cause I want to and that's reason enough You're hypnotizing me and set me free So I say thank you kindly But we all can do it for ourselves Don't give your power to nobody else now it's a moment to make a change, yeah. The future isn't here yet. Now is the time so to be free. free. Don't think about being less than yourself. Free. Don't think of being the level you for your house. Don't have to give no yeah. one. Don't have to steal from no one. To make a change or two, 99 to break chains over you. Yeah, you're spitting better, break cast you. Not ashamed, you're looking at it from a brain that has blue. All the same that the boys go through. Yo, steady, this heaven is what the boys have to. Don't think about being less than yourself. Let me see what came through. Fresh cast, steady, you're free. You're going out for a booze up. Don't seize up, tell a new boy. Better stay underground, fly to your times up. Make your mind up. Never gonna be left behind down for the old school times. Everybody, sing it for you. Here we go. Don't yeah. think about being less than yourself Yeah, you can't be the man for your for your hell You don't have to do it, no one If you want to get up and dance, you know, just do it That's what they are for Don't think about being less than yourself Yeah, you can't be the man for your for your hell You don't have to do it, no one Don't have to sleep on no one Hey, my If anybody else wants to get up and sing, you know, do it. Free. Don't think about being less than yourself. Free. Free. Don't have to be the man you for your house. Don't have to kill no one. Don't have to steal from no one. Free. Don't think about being less than yourself. Free. Don't have to be the man you for your house. Don't have to give no one, don't have to see from no one. See, it wasn't so bad being hypnotized, was it? Oh, so. So you were. How would it be to be free? How would it be? Please thank everybody who's taken part tonight. Duncan Walsh Atkins, thank you. Thank you.